Last time we looked at some of the memory protection features that are offered by the system. Things like non-executable stacks, address space layout randomization or ASLR, stack canaries, and the idea of just adding bounds checking to vulnerable programs. To demonstrate that the bounds checking is the only sort of real true solution and that the others are just mitigations, we're going to demonstrate one bypass mechanism for one of the protection features that we talked about. So we're going to look at um, how the concept of a return to libc attack um, defeats non-executable stacks. So um, the idea was that uh, the non-exec stack kind of prevents or mitigates shell code because we can't run code out of the stack. However, it's not often that the attacker would need to introduce completely custom code into the stack to execute. Odds are all of the functions they would ever need are already mapped into memory. When a program is compiled and linked against something like the libc standard library, uh, odds are that the functions the attacker needs, even if they're not being used by the vulnerable program, have still been mapped into memory as part of that libc library. So for example, the system call that would allow you to run shell commands or just exit or printf or anything like that. So the idea is that the stack is smashed like before, but instead of inserting a return address that points to maybe a function that's local to that program or to the address of the buffer where shellcode might live, now we would pass the address of a libc function that's mapped somewhere else in memory, typically you know between the heap and the stack. And so when the program goes to return, it will return to that libc function, hence the name return to libc. Okay. So you can get the address of any function that you might need by loading up the program in GDB, setting breakpoint, running it, and then just saying print and then the name of the function that you want to examine. So this slide, for example, shows getting the address of printf, of exit, and of system. I'll demonstrate that um, in my terminal now. So as before, we've got our vulnerable example here and we have this make file. Um, you can see from the make file, we've removed the line that said dash z exec stack. Um, by removing that line, now when we compile, we will get a program with a non-executable stack by default. So we can run make. Okay, again, it's gonna warn us that gets is insecure, but we know that that's the whole point. Okay, uh, now to get the addresses of the functions that we might be interested in, we can run gdb and load our compiled program in there. I can set a breakpoint at main and then run the program. We need to actually run the program so that all of the dynamically linked libraries will be loaded into memory and we can get the correct address for the functions that we're interested in. Okay, so we can say things like print the address of printf, for example. And we can see that printf lives at uh, f7 e07 a60. And so we can do this for any of the functions that we might want to call, like put string, maybe exit, and system. Okay, so here's the addresses for those. Uh, just so we have those handy, I'm just going to paste them into this um, second pane down below. And we'll return briefly to um, the slides to talk about what we're going to do next. Okay, so we have the addresses of the functions that we want, of the uh, ones we want to execute. So the idea is that we're going to do our overflow like before, but then we're going to put in the address of, for, we'll start with exit uh, that we looked up. Right. So in this slide though, you can see that obviously there's a problem where we would have nulls there, but you saw that it, when we pulled up the actual addresses of the functions that I was running, uh, I don't have any nulls in my, uh, in my function addresses. So like before, we would run our exploit and feed it into the vulnerable program. And rather than returning either to main or to into the stack somewhere, the program should just call exit and terminate immediately. Uh, it's not particularly exciting, but we just want to make sure that this works. So uh, we're going to build our program, which we already did. We have example one out there. So we are going to run uh, Python. We're going to print. Uh, some number of A's. Uh, I think we need like 36 of them uh, to account for other local variables, padding, the base pointer that we want to overflow, things like that. And we're going to feed that into example one. Dot out. 
Now, in here, just for starters, we're going to put the address of the call to exit. Again, in Little Indian, so x a0, x c3, x d e, x f7. Mm, segfault. Maybe we didn't quite get the number of bytes right. So let's just run gdb qc core and see where we got to. Oh, yeah, we had to add two more bytes. See, we had the f7. DE, uh, we needed two more. So I'll just add two more bytes of padding. Um, so that should be 38. There, you can see, uh, you know, it read our malicious string, so the address of buffer is whatever, and then the program terminated right away. We know that the call to exit must have worked because otherwise, um, one, we would have gotten a seg fault like we did before, we didn't, and had we just returned into main, there would have been extra content printed um, because the program typically prints a message when it gets back to main, for example, right? Uh, we never got here, so we know that our call to exit worked successfully. You could also trace this um, to observe the um, eventual system call to exit um, by saying, I'm gonna run S trace on this, and you see the last thing that was called was uh, exit group with the value of zero. Um, so that's not particularly interesting. Uh, what we might want to do instead is, you know, call something um, a little more fun. For example, something like printf or put string or something like that. Here's where it gets a little bit tricky because if we're going to call printf, we need to pass it parameters, and we need to remember the normal structure of a program where something goes looking for parameters. Right? Typically, parameters would be pushed onto the stack, and then a return address would sit on top of that, and on top of that, we would have other local variables and you know, save base pointer and things like that. So when we start um, building more complicated uh, return to libc calls, we almost have to assemble miniature stack frames inside of our malicious buffer that we're using to overflow the program. So for example, on this slide, um, you know, there's a bunch of padding here. Here's the address to printf. Here's a return address that needs to sit between printf and its parameters. And over here on the right in purple, we have the um, parameter, which in this instance is the address of an environment variable holding the string we want to print. I'll discuss that in a second. Um, to make things a little bit cleaner though, when printf finishes, it's going to actually go to the adjacent value here as its return address. We could, you know, put in an address of an instruction in main if we wanted the program to resume in main, or we just saw that if we bounce to the address for exit, we'll exit the program cleanly. So now rather than crashing our programs every time, you know, we can have our malicious call to printf with its parameter over here, and when printf returns, it will pop the adjacent value off the stack and return there. So we can actually return to exit and exit cleanly, okay? Um, so I'm going to try doing that. Uh, rather than printf, I'll just use put string since we're not passing, you know, a format specifier and stuff. Um, but the address we need um, to insert a parameter um, needs to come in there. So we're going to find out how we get the string to actually print. Okay. One of the easiest ways um, to mimic this, other, I mean, you could push text onto the stack and find out the address of the text and do it that way. But for a simple example, you know, we could export an environment variable because the user's environment variables will also be inside of the virtual address space for the process when we go to uh, run this. So you can export some environment variable, uh, give it a value, just some string. Then you would load up your program. And if we look far enough down in the stack, um, which is what this command here is doing, like basically print like a thousand strings out of the stack. Uh, eventually we'll get down to an area where we're gonna see the user's environment variables and the address that that variable um, sits at. And because we don't want the entire thing as a string, maybe we just want a piece of it, uh, we would have to adjust the memory address by adding a few bytes to it. Another thing you might notice is when you go to run the program um, outside of GDB, um, just because of extra content in the stack, you might have to um, add some uh, bytes to the address you got. But it's it's a little bit of trial and error, but it doesn't take long. Um, so let's have a look at our example again. So uh, first thing I'm going to do is export an environment variable. Uh, we'll just call it test. And that's going to be equal to uh, the string return to libc. So we know that that's my string. Okay. Uh, we're going to load up example in uh, GDB, set a breakpoint in main, 
and run the program. So now we should be able to examine the stack for my program and actually find these uh, environment variables. So I can say x like, I don't know, 400s from ESP. Okay, It's going to give us a ton of output. If we scroll up though, here you can see we've landed where um, you know the user's environment variables for their current session seems to be. Right? So a lot of data you might want is actually in here. Um, you know, if you're trying to figure out the current user's username, um, that might be useful. Uh, if we go down a little bit, uh, a really helpful string that lives in the stack already is a shell, uh, the name of the current shell. So, for example, if someone was actually trying to write real um, shell code to basically spawn a shell by overflowing a program, the string they need is already in there. So you could just pass this to system and that would hopefully um, spawn a shell for you. There's a couple of caveats like needing to leave standard in open and things like that. Um, but if we scroll down a little bit more, uh, we should see my test string right here. Okay, so And the address of that string lives here. Um, so we're just going to copy that address. I'm going to paste it down here. Say the environment variable we want lives at that address. So I'm going to quit out of GDB and we're going to assemble our exploit string because we have the address for put string, for exit, and for our environment variable, although we might need to adjust it a little bit. Okay, so we're just going to go back up here. Um, we're, we can leave the padding and everything the same. Um, our call to exit lives there, so we want our call to put string to go there. And we want the parameter to put string to go after the call to exit. Okay, so we're going to fill in these uh, values. Oops. Again, in little Indian, so put string is a0, uh, 4, 5, oops, a0, 4, 5. Okay, so we have that. Um, then there's the call to exit. And then we need the address of the string, which is this one here. Again, like I said, we might need to add some values to it. You'll see that in a second. Um, B0, DF, FF, FF. So if we run this oops, without S trace, you're going to see, um, you know, in main, uh, address the buffer. And we ended up printing out the string us.utf8. Um, if we run our environment variables, we can see that that string is actually just a little bit uh, before the string that we were interested in. So we're, we're sitting up here right now. So we need to add, what, 3, 6, 29, 12, 17-ish. Um, okay, so we're just going to add, uh, maybe we'll change this from B0 to C0 and see where that gets us. Uh, nope. E0. Hey, there we go. We have to guessed it right. So um, we had to add a few bytes to the buffer, but now you can see we ended up printing the string, returned to libc, and the program also exited cleanly after that. So we know that we were able to call puts, uh, which is this call right here with this parameter, and following that we were also able to sort of chain that to a call to exit. Same thing, if we wanted to add parameters to exit, we would put them after this value, which exit is currently seeing as a return address, so we could put it over here. Um, and you can kind of chain a number of these calls together, although typically you can get you can achieve what you're after if you just call something like system or exec VE and pass it the right um, sort of parameters. Uh, and that's the idea of return to libc attacks, which you can see we were able to execute arbitrary code and function calls without having to inject code into the stack, um, since the stack right now is mapped as not executable. That's the idea of a return to MC attack. Um, the other memory protection mechanisms that we talked about can also be bypassed. Um, we talked about ASLR. Um, ASLR works great in 64-bit address spaces because there's a lot of area to move um, the components uh, that are mapped in memory around. But in a 32-bit space, 
Um, there's not that much room in memory for this stuff to live, and you'll find with some experimentation, um, you can actually brute force ASLR pretty quickly, um, just by you know choosing a value that's going to be inside the range um, that something's going to be mapped to, and just trying it over and over again. Uh, it's a little bit harder in 64-bit, but the idea is with a bunch of testing and, and some good guesswork, you can actually brute force ASLR. Um, and the other one, the stack canaries. Um, bypassing them, um, if you recall, the stack canary stays the same for the lifetime of the process. So we're going to look at a memory corruption vulnerability in a little bit called a uh, format string or a string format attack where we can actually peer into the contents of the stack. And if we can do that, we can potentially read the value of the stack canary and then um, inject that into the um, overflow so that we make it look like the stack canary hasn't been touched. So there are ways to bypass them, which is why the only like true real fix um, that's not just a mitigation is to actually change the bounds checking of the C functions to make them actually bounds check. And that's it.